All right, everyone, what's good? It is your boy, BQ. This is the Negative BQ YouTube channel. This is your Impact Lounge, Impact Wrestling Review for September 26, 2024. Joe Hendry is bound for glory. I'm sorry that this is a Monday podcast. I was out of town over the weekend. Uh, out to a C football game. Came away with the win. Good thing I didn't stick around for the uh, Chargers game yesterday because then I would have just left pissed off. So um, I've said this many times before. When I go on vacation or it doesn't matter if it's one, two day out of town, I really, really disconnect myself from wrestling. So uh, I came back and all of a sudden, you know, I, I'm seeing about I, – actually, I kind of disconnect from myself from life a little bit. Um, but I get back and I see that there's a hurricane. Um, there's casualties. It affects the impact wrestling tapings. So I'm going to direct you guys over to my guy, Mike Gilbert to the Mike and JD YouTube channel, his Patreon. He gets into all that stuff. When I get on these podcasts and I tell you that I don't care, I say that a lot. I'll be like, you know, whether I'm talking about the seating charts or what Meltzer has to say, what Sean Sapp has to say, or where the this TV deal is doing this, or we want this TV deal, we're not going to get this TV deal, or we're, you know, we're filming TV in this state. When I say that I don't care, it doesn't mean that I don't care. It means that I don't care to research that stuff. That is just not of interest to me to research. It's interest to me. I have interest in hearing about that stuff, so I'll listen to Mike and he'll fill me in. But if you're looking for my opinions on those things, you're not going to get it. So I'm I'm going to direct you over to him uh, because I care a lot more about the the television show. And then of course the little ins and outs of marketing and promotion that's going to help grow the company. But the weeds and seeds of things is not something I care to deep dive into. So um, I, I do always try to send you guys over to Mike. So if you want to know his thoughts on uh, how the, the hurricane is affecting tapings and all that Mike and JD YouTube channel. Now that's that. We're going to get into this episode of Impact that I thought was pretty decent. Uh, they are in, in San Antonio still where everything looks and sounds great. I mean, we just got this nice, loud crowd. And uh, I was on Facebook this morning for a, a couple minutes. And I don't know what... I, I came across some AEW clip. I don't remember what it was. I just... Uh, but I hit play because I had interest in it and you could barely hear the audience. I mean, would you hear watching this impact taping in San Antonio sounds better and it looks better too because they're in these yeah, huge arenas that they can't fill. And even though the crowd, I mean, I think the AEW crowds usually have more energy than a, a TNA crowd. But just due to the venue, I mean, it just sounds like they're in an empty arena almost. It sounds awful. Like TNA actually sounds a lot better. The TV show it looks it looks a lot better as well. So I've I've got to give them props for that because that is something that I have I have beat that drum for a very very long time with how the show looks and sounds. And they're uh, they're on top of things right now. I'm I'm very impressed with what they're doing. Let's get into the episode uh, before I waste too much more time. So this kicks off with uh, Jordan Grace and a mystery partner taking on Rosemary and Wendy Chu. Ariana Grace comes out and she lets us know that, you know, of course it's going to be one of her best friends <clears throat> and it is Sol Ruka. I wasn't expecting Sol Ruka. I was I was expecting um I, I forgot the girl that showed up the other day. I say the other day, it was like a month ago. I think I call her Blake Lively. It was it was the tall girl where Tom, where Tom Hannafin was like, "Ooh, very interesting." Trying to pretend like anyone knew who it was. I was expecting something like that. I was expecting someone who we hadn't heard of, someone we weren't familiar with. I missed the match with Sol Ruka on NXT. I've seen some of her matches though 
she's fucking excellent. Um, she, she's got a lot of star potential. And she was actually an opponent I was hoping was going to happen on TNA television rather than NXT television. I mentioned it last week, even though they kind of brought a couple job girls out. NXT is pretty good about, you know, especially within their women's division, them having their own moon set, excuse me, their own move set, just their own, um, their own look. Like everybody comes out and it, they're not doing each other's moves. Like you see that in AEW a lot. You see it in TNA a little bit. I, I say a little bit. They They do it more than I would like where they're just kind of borrowing each other's moves and, and people are hitting multiple cutters on a show and all that shit. NXT is like a little bit better about that. Everyone comes out and they just do stuff that nobody else does. And Sol Ruka is very, very good. That was an incredible uh, tag team partner to have. And we're going to get her on the show next week as well. Now, this being said, the match was pretty good. I was entertained with it. I think Rosemary and Wendy Chu are going to win the tag team titles here pretty soon. At Bound for Glory, I would not be surprised if they didn't go that direction. Um, Tasha Steeles. Now, when I'm watching this match, I said we're, this is going to be a no contest because, number one, we got a team who I, again, I, I don't know spoilers, I think is going to wrestle for the titles and probably win them. That is that is just a guess. And then you got Jordan Grace, who they're not going to beat under any circumstances, even a tag team match. Sol Ruka, who most likely they're not going to beat. So I'm watching this, and I'm like, this is a great opener, but I don't expect it to have a finish. And sure enough, it didn't. Towards the end of the match, Tasha Steeles runs out. a badass over here. And um, she has nothing to do with these guys. Or with these girls in the ring. She has nothing to do with them she runs out uh causes a distraction or whatever she did she broke up the match it, it, the match got thrown out as a disqualification and then we get masha slamovich meet fran stalinaskovich and listen to me i fully believe and you cannot change my mind that last week masha slamovich should have got the win over tasha Steele's. And gone off the air with her hands up next to the Hardys. We didn't need the Swanton. We didn't need the the twist of fate. I mean, I guess you can do that stuff. But TNA is always like, we got to send the crowd home happy when it comes to the Hardys. And we got to hit the moves. We got to play the hits. Masha Slamovich would have greatly benefited from winning and pinning Tasha Steeles last week. But instead, we're getting a little paint by numbers where it's okay let's have tasha Steele's run out let's make an excuse for masha slamovich to come out and i mean there was a pop because she just she probably just wrestled that match with the hardys freaking 20 minutes before that but it wasn't the same it, it at, at that point like i i really gushed last podcast how they were creating a star with masha and here I felt like she kind of went back to mid-card Masha Slamovich. I don't feel like they did a very good job capitalizing off last week. I think she should have pinned Tasha. I think they should have had a one-on-one match this episode, and she should have beat her again. But that's not what they're doing. Instead, they're kind of like dragging it out. There's going to be a six-man. I mean, it was a complete excuse for a six-man match. This was not like a creative uh, way of getting there. They just... Hey, Tasha, go run out. We need an excuse to make a match. And that's what they did. And then they're probably going to go Masha versus Tasha. It's crazy how those rhyme. They're probably going to go one-on-one after that. And and there, I I, I think, I don't know what's going to happen in the six-man tag, but I think they're losing steam a little bit. I really think they built a star the last episode, and then they like brought her back down to earth this one. I understand what they were trying to do, I just didn't, it didn't work for me necessarily. We're getting that six man tag team match next week or six woman tag team match, I guess we should say. After this, we have Gia Miller. Jesus Christ, that's perfect. Of course you're here right now. And she's interviewing King of the Block Party, Frankie Kazarian. It's a block 
party. I'm not playing with y'all, bro. And he just said, blah, 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 blah. I really tune out a lot of these backstage interviews. One thing about this episode I thought was good was they kind of took a break from the system. We didn't get the backstage promo. They had, I mean, they they did this thing where like Santana walked into the dressing room and that's nasty. Beat him all up by himself. So I guess we kind of had the system on there, but I think we needed a break from him. And so I thought this was a good good opportunity this week to not make the show about them. After this, the next match is an X Division showcase, right, Tom Hannafin? Oh! And it is uh, number one contender to the Digital Media Championship, Laredo Kid. And his opponent, Jonathan Gresham. Inky the Octopus. So, uh, I, the match was fine. Jonathan Gresham can obviously work. I think for people who like that style of wrestling, the exhibition stuff, you know, I think this was this was good. This was fine. Uh, Tom Hannafin made sure to give us the the tagline. It's not about weight limits. It's no limits. Listen, motherfucker. These are two of the smallest people on the roster, so that does not that that doesn't work in this case. This is not that does not apply. He said uh, at emergence, he's he's like weight limits, no limits. This should be limitless. That is what no limits means. Uh, but anyway, man, one of these weeks I'm not going to ride Tom. Um, it's not this week. Maybe next week. I think I think next week is going to be uh, the week that I just I just really just leave him alone. Oh! So the match was fine. It was it was good. Uh, the one thing that I had like a real, I, I let me not say I had an issue with it. I just thought it was a little cheesy. Was when <laughs> Jonathan Gresham they kind of zoomed up and he started looking at Laredo Kid's mask and Hannafin and. Ray Wall were selling this for like a good 30 seconds. Which Telegraph and Tom is now letting us know that Gresham is going to put the mask back on. What am I talking about? Gresham looked at the mask and they started saying, oh, he's looking at his mask. Maybe he's getting flashbacks. He's doing this and this. And they're just like continuing to talk about it. So um, again, Tom the Telegrapher, he is letting us know that uh, Jonathan Gresham is going to put the mask back on. Now I thought, I thought it was really silly, <laughs> just the way that they did it. But um, the match was fine, and then Jonathan Gresham got the win. Um, is he number one contender to the Digital Media Championship? I don't know. Um, poor Laredo Kid, though. He, he this this dude is sitting on that contractually obligated rematch, big time, big time, big time. After this, another X Division showcase. Tom is Speedball Mike Bailey. Jeez. Yeah. Didn't we lock you in the dumpster one time? I got out. And he is, whoops, I spoke a little too soon there. And he is uh, teaming up with the Rascals. Chris Bay. In one word, would I use dope? Nope. Man, I'm, I'm fucking this one up here. My bad. I really had to gather myself there for a second. Cheeseball Mike Bailey teamed up with Kushida and Leon Slater. That's what it was to take on Zachary. In Lawrence. one word, would I use dope? And uh, nope. ABC. Let's give ABC some sound drops. I think we got to get him in on the party. So, um, what do we got for you, Ace Austin? Is this your card? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's it's not, is it? <clears throat> no. Uh... Chris Bay. I'm terribly sorry. I don't know why I can't stop saying black. The word black. So again, this was just another X Division style match, and um, they're trying to keep Zachary Wentz strong here. And it's really weird because Trey Miguel is not involved in this at all. Because I think Zachary Wentz has some kind of bullshit street fight with Wesley coming up. So they're just kind of separating him from the Rascals, and I think that is a smart thing to do because. If you go back to when the Motor City Machine Guns were the champions, what did I keep saying every week? Like they they keep presenting them together on screen as a tag team, which 
to me, really, really devalues the world title and the X Division championship rather than just kind of splitting them up, letting them do their own thing for a little bit. So here we keep Trey McGill off TV a little bit. So we're, we, we forget that he is uh, part of the Rascals and we're able to focus on Zachary Wentz and his singles. I guess we'll call it a singles run a little bit. And they're going to keep him strong because they give him a, a bullshit X Division title run. He said, hey, let's get this belt on NXT. He has a match. He wins, and then he loses. So I think where this is clear, maybe not clearly going, I don't know that uh, Cheeseball Mike Bailey, and yes, Mike, I, I, I heard that you say you're stealing that from me. That's perfectly fine. I, I don't think Cheeseball Mike Bailey is going to be around a whole lot longer. And Leon Slater's that dude. He 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 is truly that dude. If they want to really establish the X Division as something special again, I think he's the guy that you you hitch the wagon to. He is very, very good. And, you know, for his height, he can do just some incredible things. So I'm watching this match and I don't really care about any of the participants, but I care about watching him. And uh I think they're gonna go. I think they're still going to go multi-man match. I don't think they're going to do Leon Slater versus Cheeseball Mike Bailey bound for glory. I don't see them doing that. I see it more of a a multi-person thing. It just depends on how long Mike Bailey is going to be around. Maybe he resigns. Maybe he stays. I don't know. TNA is a very good place for him. He cuts some of the worst promos in television. Awful. And I think TNA can do a lot much better job of hiding that. Um, he could fit into NXT because no one at NXT can cut promos either. I mean, they all sound fake as a $3 bill. Not that $3 bills make noise. You understand where I'm going with it. There, there, is, a, um, there is a leash there for your promos. And even though Mike Bailey has been in the industry for a while, his promos are on that level. AEW has some people who cut some really bad promos that they let get TV time, but I don't think they're as bad as he is. And, and clearly he's not going to be on the WWE main roster. So I think TNA is a very good home for him. They definitely let him speak a little bit too much, but I, I think they will play to his strengths and minimize his weaknesses a little bit more, a little more better than the other companies. That's just kind of my opinion, but you know, We'll see. We'll see. But I do think that that uh, Leon Slater is that dude, and I think that he should be the one to ultimately win the X Division title. I know Naked Jake made a promise on one of his promos, I will win it this year. And I had said, well, he wouldn't say that if he wasn't going to do it. I, I don't think he is uh, winning that title. But uh, speaking of the X Division, two of the X Division's brightest stars were backstage in a, a segment that I did not think was very good. But representing the X Division, we got Naked Jake. Do you mind if I slip into something more comfortable? And his guy, Hammerstone. Alex, I like that name. Let's sing it together. Ready? So, Jake something has clothes on for the first time since that motherfucker was Cousin Jake wearing a flannel. He is... No longer naked. And I was wondering who's gonna who's gonna crack? Is is Hammerstone gonna go naked or is Jake gonna put on clothes? And I, I don't even know what to make of this because Jake something has on clothes, Hammerstone is naked. And Hammerstone's not even the one working out. But they they are doing the meathead thing. I think that really, really works for them. Uh I'm actually excited to see them as a tag team. Uh, they they look like they were like, hey, let's go find a random blue light and stand and, and work out in front of it. And I'm sitting here like, did they travel with that curl bar on those weights? Because like, surely they didn't. Um, and even if they did, surely they didn't just bring one single singular thing to work out with. Uh, there's probably not a gym in the arena. Like all just just kind of silly. I guess there. I guess you could say there's probably a gym in the arena. Depends. I don't remember where they're filming at exactly. 
my guy Mike will definitely tell you. He'll tell you what all what the venues. Oh, they have these concerts and this sport and this and this and this. Like I give like two shits about these venues. Um, so I guess the, I guess you could say they have um, weights there. I would, if you're traveling, I would think they have bands with them, and I think that would make more sense. I'm clearly spending way too much time on this, but um, Cody Deaner walks up after this. This is an awful segment. He's you know cousin trying to get Jake's attention. Where I thought this was a misstep was that when Jake was saying I'm sick of failure and Cody's like, you're not a failure. Jake should have come back and said, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. I thought that was kind of like a missed opportunity to just add a little bit of edge to the naked man, to the naked one. Um, but Hammerstone steps up and they're going to have a match. Cody Dina versus Hammerstone. And it is such an important match that it is going to be on Explosion. Which is fine, but at least announce that the match is going to be on Explosion. You know, it's it's the bullshit show. Not a lot of people watch it. But if you want people to watch it, because you just tied a storyline into it, just say, you know, just announce 10 minutes later that the match is going to be on Explosion. After this, we get the debut of Lee Ying Lee. And whether Bill Goldberg, let me tell you something about Bill Goldberg. And uh, she went one-on-one with, uh, what was her name, Hyon? So I said this, um, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, that they brought, they were bringing in two enhancement talents for this set of tapings that they are looking at for knockouts and i I guess it's probably safe to say every time they have a enhancement talent they're probably scouting them out but i was i was specifically that her and whoever else shows up again that they're they're looking at of course the tna fan base as they always do got on twitter and every time there's an enhancement talent they say sign to this girl to the knockouts even though i know that they are looking at her i personally did not see anything here that uh that stood out to me you know, like when I'm talking about Sol Ruka earlier, and I'm not expecting her to be Sol Ruka, but when I'm talking about the NXT girls and they've got their own moon set, move sets and they they stand out and they're different, I did I did not get that from her. She was fine. I, I'm not saying she was a, a bad wrestler by any means, but there was nothing personally aside from her look that really stood out to me. But that gives you a little bit of context as well because this was not a squash match. She did get some offense in. Um, and that's because they're looking at her and they can't just say, Hey, go out there and get your ass kicked in two minutes. That that's not scouting somebody. So they had to give it a little bit of time. I thought this was fine though. Uh, you know, Yaling, uh, Ling, oh, Jesus Christ, that that's going to be a little bit of a, a different legging. Lee is going to have, she's, she's got to work that out for her a little bit. Um, and, but she was fine. So I, I was glad to uh, finally get this, and the people are looking forward to her being in the company. She has a a pretty good Instagram, like she's got a pretty good hold on social media marketing, and she she speaks pretty good English too. She's not like crystal fucking clear, but she's better than. Um, and I know she's Chinese, but who's the Japanese girl at a uh, NXT, but a uh, AW? Um, Karushita. Like she speaks a lot better than she does. And and Karushita is improving, but but um Ling Yaling Lee speaks I'm gonna struggle with that name, but uh she she speaks it uh, pretty well. After this, we have Josh Alexander coming to the ring. I don't wanna play with you anymore. And they're doing a really good job with his story right now. He lost a couple matches to his own finishes. And, you know, they went the direction that I thought they should have. Where he's, you know, it only lasted a week, but he's reflecting, um, you know, taking it all in. He's kind of a beaten, broken man. Losing a couple times with his own finishers. And he gets out there and... 
the crowd bought this. I don't think the TV audience did. I think we all knew where this was going. But he, he he's coming out. He's kind of apologizing. The crowd initially is not buying in. Come around. He calls out Eric Young. I think those like those times are like the rah rah speeches and like getting everybody up because like nobody really get motivated off that stuff anyway. But. And he sure enough came down and he uh, gave his motiv- motivational speech. You know that's what that's what he does. He is the Dax Harwood of this company. He is the the rah rah guy. And Josh did a very good job here. Josh had tears in his eyes. Uh, this is probably the third time in the last two or three months that I, I said that Josh Alexander is my favorite part of the show. And it wasn't the wrestling. It was the character work. And he actually had tears in his eyes and Eric Young saying, I love you. They play the music. Eric Young sits on the rope, opens up the rope so that Josh can step out. Josh like, no, does it for him and then hits the German suplex. And I, I popped. And I'll tell you why I popped, even though I knew it was coming. Because usually it's kick the ropes, nut shot, just hit him from behind. I mean, just the fact that it was just a German suplex of all things. It it was just different. It's different than the way they do this. Like when Jake turned on Eric Young not too long ago. Poor Eric Young, right? Uh, when, When Jake, you know, he waited for Eric Young to turn around and he hits Eric Young from behind. Just the German suplex of it, I thought was was excellent. and. His guy, Steve Macklin, ends up running down. And then what we expected was Sinner and Saint coming down and making their little heel turn, joining Josh Alexander. And I'm very interested to see where this goes with Josh with a little bit of a, a stable a couple lackeys. I'm very interested in this. They're they're adding some some layers to Josh Alexander that we just did not get, mainly because he was a white meat baby face, but we, you know, we had two, three years of him just white meat talking about the best professional professional wrestler in the world and just having good matches and long matches and always being in the title picture. This is really, really refreshing for him. So I'm I'm very excited actually about this. That this was this was really entertaining to me. Now what was not entertaining, Santino Morella backstage. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And he is talking to Steph Delander. Everybody's been real nice. Well, that's because you have big jugs. And they have um they don't have jugs in, in common, but they have neck surgeries. In common, so I'm curious if they're gonna try to keep SDL on TV a little bit. I mean, you you kind of have to for this storyline, but the story is almost over. I know she, you know, if, if you're getting neck surgery, it's no joke. I don't think she's gonna be. I don't think it's safe to just be traveling all the time, but I do think she's kind of needed for the storyline right now. And. Matt Cardona walks up, and of course they're conveniently standing in front of colorful lights. Matt Cardona walks up, and Santino lets him know that he has a match with PCO at Bound for Glory, and it is going the exact direction that I said it would because he lets him know that it is Monster's Ball. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell you. Right, let me tell you <laughs> we don't care. And it is the, the match most likely to be a complete shit show at Bound for Glory. Every pay-per-view has has one match that is overbooked and they're trying to get everyone on the show and this is it. And it always involves PCO. Whether PCO is in the match or not. Like, they get PCO on the fucking show. So he's got a match here this time. And I I do think that we're going to see the Shiraz and the Rhinos, uh, Madman Fultons. I think we're going to see the monsters involved in this. I think that's kind of what the story is telling us. And a lot of people message me saying, BQ, you call it, it's Monster's Ball. I I don't even take that much credit because it only goes one direction with PCO. It doesn't matter what the story is leading up to it. It doesn't matter if he is on a honeymoon, if he is married, if he is engaged, he's proposing, if he's just having a normal feud. 
it does not matter. It it doesn't matter if it's the cinematic stuff leading leading up to this. If he's getting hit with cinder blocks, if he's it does not matter. It is monsters ball. That is the way it ends every single time. There's there's so in that sense, PCO is a a one note song, a one trick pony. Now the the gimmick is great. My kids love freaking PCO's gimmick. He is over. That is not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is that it goes one direction, and he usually wins. I would love to see Matt Cardona win because he is PCO is doing jack shit with those with those belts. And I'm gonna say it again: huge missed opportunity when they rebranded to get a legit mid card title, a television championship. They stuck with the digital media championship, and it is just continuing to mean absolutely nothing. This company does not have a mid card title. They've got titles. They've got the X division. They've got the the digital media. But we don't look at it and be like, hey, they got an intercontinental championship or they got a, even a, a U.S. championship. He's doing nothing with these. Um, so Matt Cardona needs to win them. But PCO just always seems to win. Like there's just no. I, I don't remember that. I don't think he's ever lost a feud on this show. Well, every baby face always gets her come up in some TNA. There's no, there's no, we're going to push a heel by having him beat the baby face. And we'll talk about that here again in a little bit. The baby face always gets her come up in, but TN, uh, PCO just doesn't lose. So I, I really wouldn't be shocked if he doesn't beat Matt Cardona. He's eventually going to beat him because they, that, that just way, the way they book. One way or another, if he loses here, he's they're they're gonna keep wrestling until PCO wins. But it goes one direction and one direction only, and there's just no no deviation from that. Then we got um Heather Reckless. He has an erection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all her fault. And she goes one on one with Queen of the Rubber Man. <laughs> Zaya Brookside. And I would not be shocked if these two didn't have a rematch after this and then the eventual rubber match. <laughs> I, I thought this was fine because I like both of them. And I have more of a stomach for women's wrestling because there's much less of it. Now, this was a real knockout heavy show. There's, there's just three women's matches on this show. Lots of knockouts. Tag team matches. Well, one singular tag team match, but run-ins, like lots of knockouts on this episode. I have more of a stomach for women's matches because they're not as long. And they're they're just different from the rest of the show. Whether it's one of them, whether it's two of them on the show, you know, everything else, you know you're seeing guys wrestle. And there's a lot of grab ass and tickle dick and X Division stuff. The women just stand out to me. Those segments just stand out. So even though this match really was not phenomenal, I was I was into it enough. Um, Heather Reckless ends up winning this match. She hits the rarefied air. Mike pointed this out <laughs> that she's like now one of like four people that do the Swanton in this company. And I have pointed that it pointed it out many times. How many people are going to do cutters? How many pile drivers are we getting? How many clotheslines are we getting? You know, I when when Heather had her debut match and she hit her finish, I was like, "That's a great finish." She can't hit that consistently. That like that's she's gonna need something else. I hope it's not this. I, we don't. We really don't need. I, I mean, I, I I get what they're trying to do, but I hope that it's that that isn't it. I don't hope. I I hope she's not just another person doing a swanton in this company. But um, it was fine. Heather Reckless wins. After this, um, backstage is Ash by Awful Sauce and the personal concierge. That's my dad. But don't worry, he's cool. Really? <laughs> he doesn't look cool. Oh, and I can't go. And then Heather Reckless walks in, and I've I've praised Heather her ring work. And I was a little bit familiar with her before she got here. Like she's very, very good. Her promos are like I don't, I don't want to call them promos because she doesn't really talk like that, but she is a horrible actress. Now she's new, but this is this was very bad. This segment was very bad, but I have interest in where they're 
where they are going with it. So they're going to give uh, Heather a makeover. And it was very convenient that she lost hair in this match. Um, I know that it was, it was by accident that she had some extensions pulled out. But I thought that actually worked for uh, the context of, you know, the story that they are they are going with here. So um, I'm, I'm curious if she, they're going to change her name. You know, she could be Heather, Heather Elegance. I mean, it sounds okay. Um, I don't know if they're going to stick with Reckless or not. They may or may not. But I saw this. Not so much that I saw it a mile away, but I just saw it when they were on screen together the very first time. I was like, I can see her being a mini me. I think I said this last time. I hate that term more than anything. Not anything. Everything annoys me. You guys already know this about me. I, I will find I will be annoyed by something when it comes to everybody. You know, you you only got to be around me for two minutes. I will be annoyed by you with something that you that you do. Uh, but mini me is one of my my pet peeves because it's not original. Everyone's been used. Everyone, oh, here's me and my kid, my mini me. But for the sake of argument, that's the best way to explain this. Because she is obviously of much shorter stature, she she works perfect in this role. Just kind of like Savannah Evans is the big bodyguard. Um, I, I said on a mailbag show, by the way, they're repackaging. So she will be back, for those of you wondering. But just like Savannah Evans plays the bodyguard, she Heather Reckless can do the lackey very well. You can just you can just see it. You know, there's enough similar similarities in them physically that uh, they can pull it off. And I think in the long term, Heather will very much get over as a, a baby face because of that. And then the main event. Oh, and, I kick out. and it is the Frankie Gazarian King of the Block Party versus Joe Hendry. Um, I saw on Twitter that I guess Frankie Gazarian didn't like the way that she announced Joe Hendry. I'm not going to bullshit you. I kind of fast forwarded through all that. I know that Joe Hendry got jump started. Uh, he he started. He's, he's like, you're not the king of TNA or the this. And then Frankie Kazarian uh, jump started the match. So I do want to say what they did a very good job with, with. Like say, I think I'm. I think I brought this up last week. You don't even have to watch AEW. If you even follow their social media, you know that every number one contender is always, it's a battle royal. It's a tournament. Like they creatively don't know how to get there with next man up. TNA does. TNA does not have to do those silly matches. They were able to take Joe Hendry, who if you rewind a few months ago, pinned Moose, who was the world champion at the time at Slammiversary, uh, Josh turned on him, so then he had to do a little program with Josh. And then Frankie Kazarian, once upon a time, beat him and cheated and then threw him in the Battle Royal. Joe Hendry got his comeuppance against multiple opponents before getting to this point. And that is that is how you build someone. Now, I didn't think they did the best job of... of it, it was like Slammiversary ended... And then Joe Hendry's still fucking around with the system for whatever goddamn reason. Completely forgetting that he's mad at Josh, that he's fr mad at Frankie. And I understand they're probably not trying to telegraph stuff, but Telegraph and Tom Telegraph's all sorts of shit. You know, so you would just think with this one, there would be some kind of reminder that Joe Hendry has beef with these guys. It would, like, it was a whole month that passed before he gave a shit about any of those two guys. But... They did circle around. You know, he beat Josh Alexander, moves on to beat Frankie Gazarian. And Frankie's got his own arc at this point because he is saying, hey, this motherfucking fighting champion over here, I want to fight for the title. And they're not giving him that title shot. You know, everyone else getting a title shot. Frankie's not getting it. So you're, you come to a head and you have two guys who were legit, who have legit, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, legit claim of being the number one contender. You know, this isn't like, hey, we just threw two random people into a match for the number one contendership. That's not what they did here. There's like 
kind of two separate story arcs that came to an head to a head. And then they had this match. Now I thought that this was going to be a triple threat, a triple threat at Bound for Glory, because again, I'm thinking like Scott Demore. Scott is not around. This was probably the right decision to make. Joe Hendry versus Nick Nemeth. Um, Joe Joe Hendry wins the match. The match was fine. They both can work. Uh, you know the they had the spot where Frankie Xarian hits Joe Hendry with the brass knuckles. Daniel Spencer, who is the the least of the goof refs, he turns around, does a complete 360 while Frank Xarian is hitting him with the brass knuckles. He had absolutely no reason to do that. He he just turns around purposely so that he can miss the brass knuckle shot and then turns back around. It was it, it looked awful. It looked very fake. And then they restart the match. Um, because good old Santino comes out. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And lets us know that we're restarting the match. And then shortly after that, Joe Hendry wins, and he is the number one contender at Tom Hannafin. Bound for glory. And this is probably the right thing to do. I expect Joe Hendry to win the title at Bound for Glory because he's already lost for the NXT Championship. And he didn't win the title at Slammiversary. Surely he is not losing another title opportunity. So I think he's going to win here. I do know that internally the company doesn't feel he needs the belt, that he is over. But it makes sense. It makes sense for him to win it here and to to beat Nick Nemeth. Because Nick probably is not going to be around past the year if we're just going off past behavior of when we see guys like this show up in the company. He never signed. So the right thing to do is have Joe Hendry win. But then it's interesting because we know we got to get Santana in the mix here. And I do think this was the Santana spot. But they had to pivot for Joe Hendry. So that's why Santana is just constantly going after the system. Moose has pinned Santana twice. So that story is is, is fine. It's elongated. It's... um. You know, Santino, Santino, Santana needs to get his ultimate comeuppance. So, and they're taking their time with it. So he's got to eventually beat Moose. And then we're going to see if it is a Santana versus Joe Hendry. Like, I don't even know if the company knows what to do because I don't think they were prepared for this. I think the plan was either Santana or Frankie Gazarian versus uh, the man known as Dolph Ziggler, formerly known as Dolph Ziggler at Bound for Glory. That's what I think they were trying to do. I've I've got on them before about their inability to pivot when they need to pivot, but they've had time for this one. They've had time to, you know, this wasn't like, hey, something just happened. We've got two weeks to figure out a plan. Like they ha- they've had several months to sit on this and say, hey, Joe Hendry is getting very popular. So we need to find a way to to get there with him. I've already told you guys I don't like Joe Hendry like that. I like him, but I don't like him like that. To me, he is a mid carter that can wrestle in the main event. I don't think he is a bona fide man, main eventer personally. I'm sure that m- the majority of you disagree with that, but to me, he's still a mid Carter because he's still corny. He does corny shit. And um, there's, I know Mike said something very similar, but there's a real John Cena aspect about this that they need to be very, very careful with. The difference is that John Cena got over being a badass and then, kind of turned soft over time. Joe Hendry's always kind of been that soft character. He was able to get it over, which is a benefit for him. That means people like the the silliness, the cheesiness, the songs, but they find a way to put a little edge on him. I said the thing about the same thing about Rich Swan when he won the title. Okay, great. But if you don't put a little edge on him, he wasn't cheesy, but he was you know, what's up, my brother? You know, it, it just wasn't like a serious character. And I was like, you you got to add a little something to him, a little juice uh, to make him credible as a world champion. So I think they have to really, really be careful with that, with Joe Hendry, um, you know, him grabbing the microphone and talking every match. And he, you know, he, he used to sing the songs. Now he's talking and trying to hit you with the zingers on the one-liners. Sometimes they land, sometimes they don't. 
but there's a real there's a real shot that this goes like south John Cena wise with him and then they're going to be forced to turn him heel so they got to handle him the right way they cannot handle him like no matter what this guy does is over this isn't the rock you know the rock can just do whatever and it's over i don't think that's the case with joe hendry and they can't treat him like that so if he does win the title they do got to sit there and say okay what direction are we going with it now where are we going to give him an edge or how much of an edge what are we going to do that's that's different because corny characters get over, but corny characters aren't world champions. They have to be extremely careful with that. So, uh, decent enough episode. I think everyone was happy to see Joe Hendry win. I do think he'll win the championship. It, it just wouldn't make sense for him not to. The only reason is if it was a triple threat and Frankie Gazarian won, and then he took it off Frankie Gazarian at like hard to kill or something, I could... Uh, kind of live with that but i think they're gonna strike while the iron's hot with joe hendry and then figure it out from there so that's gonna do it for me folks again i'm sorry that this this was kind of like a week late not a week but a day late uh, just because i was out of town um but thanks for rocking with me and we're gonna do this again real soon i'm out peace <laughs>